good afternoon and we have all a nice lecture from Bill on PBEs and what we are doing now is a very different topic that is acetonic analysis of but what we really want to do is acetonic analysis of differential equations. Um, both uh, ordinary differential equations and P. And, uh, but first, we have to agree about the concepts because they are very, very subtle, very yeah, not difficult, but a lot of different aspects of, of, uh, of really, uh, the concepts which we are using. So, we have to be very careful. So what I will do is I will go fairly slowly to indicate the, the foundations. Um, I will use this book, Mathematics, Applications of Singular Perturbations. And today, uh, that will be on chapter two and four. Now, this is, um, this is far too much to treat in one half hour, unless you hurry, hurry a lot. So, I, I, I made a list which I have, which I will consult now and then, of the most essential things, uh, but there is more in the chapters when you read uh, that. I'll try to, to give you the most essential things. And at first, uh, the first thing is we'll talk about real fun. So we, we leave out at this, at this time complex functions, maybe later a little bit, I don't know. But it's all real functions. And we'll talk about uh, continuous functions. And I'll introduce a small parameter, epsilon. And epsilon is a parameter which is at the smallest zero and much smaller than one. So this parameter will play a part all the time. And you can have more parameters in real life problems, but let's start to understand what happens when we have one parameter. Now, you may ask, what is small? And that's a very natural question. So, the first question for you is, uh, suppose I take epsilon 1 dot of 0, 5. Do you think that's a small epsilon? Who, th who thinks that this, is that this is a small epsilon? Mm -hmm. Nobody? Mm -hmm. Everybody yeah. thinks it's a large number? Yeah. Yeah. No, nobody dares to put on your finger. Who thinks it's a small, a small number? Yeah. Well, two? Mm -hmm. Oh, everybody else thinks it's not. That's very strange. Who thinks that it's a large number? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what you see here is how difficult it is to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I could do is let you write down on the paper and then give it to me. Uh, <laughs> then you, there would be no problem. But anyway, suppose there are these two persons who say this is a small number. And I suspect that nearly everyone thinks it's a small number. Now, I'm looking at 1 over epsilon. And 1 over epsilon, well, epsilon is small, that is a large number. In this case, this is 20. So, what what you are saying is that if this is a small number, it means it is close to zero, and that this is close to infinity. 
Yeah. I mean, if you say this is close to zero, then this is close to infinity. Mm -hmm. So, you see already, I, this is very confusing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I do this on purpose. That the, the notion of what is small is very arbitrary. And the notion of what is large is very arbitrary. Uh, if you have, for instance, uh, 15,000 euros, you have a lot of money. If you have 15,000 rupiah, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit less. <laughs> so, you have to be very careful in indicating what the small, what the large, what are the unit is. And you will find this also when you make real life applications, when you talk to chemists, to physicists, etc. It's all, uh, well, it depends. You have to really say to each other what you exactly mean by everything. Um, this is the cleaner. Yeah. So I'll remove these confusing examples. <laughs> and I want to introduce order functions. Order function. Delta epsilon. It's a function of epsilon and it is positive or at most zero, at its lowest. It's continuous. Can you read this in the back? You must complain if you can't read it. Uh, I can write it large. Anyway, I will say it's continuous and uh, semi-definitional. Semi now, what are these order functions? These order functions are the kind of uh, measure sticks. They measure the size of functions. That's what, what we're going to do. And a typical order function is, for instance, delta epsilon is just epsilon. So if you say a function is, say, of size epsilon, now we have to explain and to define what we mean by that, of course. And then that is really the measure stick is, is this. But another example is epsilon squared, or uh, say e to the minus 1 over epsilon, minus 1 over epsilon. This is also a function of epsilon. So, and it is positive. Uh, if epsilon is uh, very small, then 1 over epsilon becomes very large. So, this goes to 0. Then, right? You can use all these things as, as four functions. And now, when you say that something is of size epsilon, or of size this is exponential, then you want to, to say that something is smaller or larger. So we have the order symbol. And the order symbol says this. So one order function is large O of another order function if delta 1 epsilon more or equal than then constant times delta 2 epsilon. Where F, m is a positive constant, which of course is not dependent on epsilon. So if I have this, then, uh, I, then well, what I say is this is about roughly the size uh, example. Example. Um, say uh, epsilon squared plus epsilon is small o of sinus epsilon. 
And you have to think about that. It's important to realize whether it's, this is true or not. Well, sinus epsilon, you know you can make Taylor expansion, sinus epsilon, that is epsilon minus 1 over 6 epsilon the third, etc. It's a convergent expansion which you can give for the sinus. So near zero, and that's what I'm doing here, looking near zero, in the neighborhood of zero, the sinus epsilon behaves like epsilon. And the epsilon squared doesn't matter really because epsilon is larger than epsilon squared. That is also an exercise. Uh, I, I will come to, I'll come back to that. But you know, in the neighborhood of zero, if epsilon is a half, epsilon squared is a quarter. And if you make epsilon smaller, it becomes worse. Uh, if you make a picture, and this is epsilon, and this is epsilon squared. So epsilon squared is smaller than epsilon. Epsilon dom dominates this expression. And sinus epsilon, in fact, behaves like epsilon and dominates, epsilon dominates the sinus in the neighborhood of zero. So when you look at it carefully enough, you see that it is true. Now, uh, I, want, I, I said already, epsilon squared is smaller than, than epsilon. And I demonstrate this with a picture. And you can use the analysis to really prove this. For, for instance, they are um, But uh, I need, in fact, another definition to give, to tell you about what is small. So, I give you next, uh, let's say again, this is small O of delta to epsilon, which means it's really smaller. So the O, the small O means it's this one is smaller than this one if the limit for epsilon goes to zero of delta one epsilon divided by delta two epsilon is zero. So think a little bit about it. It looks very trivial, but think about it. It means in, in words, that delta 1 goes faster to 0 with epsilon than delta 2 it goes faster. And that, that is demonstrated, for instance, in this picture. Epsilon squared is small o of epsilon. It goes faster to 0 than epsilon. Right? So that's, uh, that gives you two ways of comparing all of them. Two ways. You have big O, that means it really behaves roughly the same. I will say a little bit more about that. It behaves roughly the same. It's a different thing. It's really different. But for epsilon goes to zero, it behaves the same. There is already a subtle problem here, but that will come later. And then, but that this is very clear. It's small all of epsilon if it just if it just goes faster. So if you divide it by, it still goes to zero. So if you divide epsilon squared, zero, epsilon squared by epsilon, then it still uh, goes to zero because epsilon squared divided by epsilon is again. Epsilon. Uh, the, as I said, there is already here a subtle problem. Um, um, it can also be, this can also be small. So, what you have, for instance, an epsilon squared is 
small is, is, is big O of sine is epsilon. Uh, that's uh, but that, that's that's also true, right? Because epsilon squared, if you take the definition that is small, you can you can find an M so that that it is true. It's just a matter of uh, well, you can look at the graph and you say uh, you have here. Well, if I go for very large value, the sign is become zero again, but I look in the neighborhood of this, and epsilon squared goes like this. So this is really small. But also, also, epsilon squared is, ah, sorry, is small O of sine is epsilon. So if it's big O, it can also be small O. So that's not very nice. It means that you have an estimate, it can also be a better estimate. So you have to realize that. But this is a little bit more clear. Um, now, what I have here is in the neighborhood of zero, I have an ordering of functions, an ordering of functions which is given by big O and small O. I'm telling in this way that things are bigger or smaller in the sense of behavior near zero. So this is really, you have to be accustomed, that's why I'm going slowly, you have to really get accustomed to it because it is for most of you a new, new concept, a new idea to compare functions. And I, I will add a little bit to the confusion, uh, which is always good because real knowledge always starts with confusion. You get confused and then you think and you try to sort it out and then suddenly you see the light. <laughs> or not. I hope. <laughs> I hope. I hope. <laughs> I'm sure all of you will see that. <laughs> now, the confusion which I will add. Do you can always compare all functions in this way? Now, well, that's very clear. I can compare this and this and this. I can compare, I may compare all these things. So, can you always compare? Now, here, here comes the confusion. I suppose I have three functions. And one is yes, epsilon. So it goes to zero like a straight line. And then the other one is epsilon squared. It goes faster. And now I take, I have made an example that is yeah, that is a nice example. That is the third function, that is epsilon sinus squared 1 over epsilon. This is an uh, interesting function. What happens if epsilon goes to zero? Now, the sinus is always bounded, so it goes to zero. Right? You all agree? Okay. What happens to the sinus? Well, if epsilon goes to zero, one over epsilon goes to infinity. So the sinus becomes an infinite number of times zero in, in each neighborhood of zero. Oh, that is really, really fantastic. Think about it. Sinus one over epsilon becomes an infinite number of times zero near uh, uh, the uh, in the neighborhood of epsilon zero. So what I can do for instance is I can add uh, I can add the epsilon squared for instance. Then what you do here, so for instance I start when this is just one. 
doesn't go like this, but it will, it will always be at least epsilon squared, but now I am at the zero of the sine, and it will go up again, and go up, and it will oscillate an infinite number of times between epsilon and epsilon squared. But that's, that's an interesting example. It means that you cannot say that it is all epsilon or that it is all epsilon squared. It's really a, a different type of, of function. So it means that if you say it more abstractly, more mathematically, that in the set of order functions, all complete order functions which you have, it is only a partial ordering of the order functions. Partial ordering. You cannot say that, uh, uh, that if, say, you have uh, three functions, that you can always say this one is larger than that one, and that one is larger than that one, etc. That everything is all. You have just also these alternating things. So, that makes life a little bit more complicated, but as you will see, there are problems where you need such, such wild behavior, but mostly you can handle problems, well, not simply only with epsilon and epsilon squared, there are more complicated things, but this kind of wild behavior is, is not so good. Okay. So this is the basis which uh, you have to realize very well. And let's see. Okay. Um, maybe I should uh, I should clean a little bit. Um, yeah. This is clear. Okay. Yeah, now, now 
I'm coming to more to differential equations. And you will say, well, that's a different thing. Differential equations are functions of t, of x, of x and y, or whatever. And uh, what has that to do with epsilon? Well, let's just write down an example. Simple example. I have taken one of the exam simple examples. All the examples in the book are extremely simple, of course, but I have tried to take the simplest. Uh, the x, the x, uh, sorry, the phi, function phi, the x plus epsilon times phi. Ah, here we have epsilon. It's equal to I took cosine of x and I give an initial condition phi zero is just zero and I I have to specify of course the domain otherwise it makes no sense. I, I said already everything will be real so I don't have to specify uh, phi but phi will be a real function and it will be at least uh, C1, C1 that is uh, one time continuous differential. So phi uh, is in C1, 0, or infinity. So define for x equal or larger than 0 on the positive real line. So, I can solve this equation, of course. It's one of the elementary equations from, uh, uh, from your, all the lectures which you have got. Well, that's no fun. That's no fun. Because solving equation that's only possible during lecture hours, but in real life you can never solve exactly the equation. That's very rare. So, we're not going to solve this. We consider that there's a problem which we cannot solve and we want to uh, try to obtain a solution in terms of powers of epsilon. So what I propose is the following thing. I propose to look for a solution in this form. Phi x is phi not x plus epsilon by 1x plus epsilon squared by 2x plus uh, epsilon to the n by nx etc. Now just try to find the solution in this form. And it, is, it has a name. It has a, a very long name. It is the name of a formal, regular expansion. Regular, well, will be clear in, in uh, somewhat later during the hour. Uh, and formal, in mathematics, mathematic, mathematicians are in general very strange people. <laughs> you already have discovered during your study. Uh, but uh, they use formal when it is really informal. <laughs> uh, it means it is, you do not know if it's convergent, if it's mathematical, has any meaning. And then you call it formal, which is of course a crazy expression. It's an informal uh, regular expression. But okay. Uh, we keep to the standard uh, notation of mathematicians. We call this a formal regular expansion, which means regular will be later. It looks very regular, so that's where the words come from. But I can say more about that. Uh, and we do not know if it, if it can be used. That's part of the impact of the lectures which, which are today and the coming days. 
I can just substitute this formally in the equation. And for epsilon is zero, well, let's, let's just first substitute. So I get uh, d phi naught dx plus epsilon d phi one dx plus, I just don't write down all the other things, plus epsilon phi naught plus epsilon squared phi one plus etc. is cosine x. And what you do, you compare left and right the same order of epsilon and you put them equal. So order zero, order epsilon to the power zero, or so that's really, really one, yeah, the first term, that's this, yeah, this is all epsilon and higher. So the phi naught the dx is cosine x. Now we can easily solve that. We just integrate, we find phi naught is sine is x plus a constant. But I can apply the initial conditions here, and then I conclude that phi naught x is sinus x. Okay, that's clear. Let's, let's do the next step. I compare epsilon, uh, the epsilon order terms, that is this one and this one and nothing else. So, it is the equation is d phi 1 dx uh, yeah, is minus uh, epsilon naught, which is uh, minus, minus epsilon naught, is minus sinus x. So you see, you get immediately a recurrent system which you can go on solving. So if I integrate this, I find phi 1 of x is cosine x plus some constant by integration. Oh, what will be the constants? Uh, hmm. Well, I have already uh, used the initial condition. So, if I not obey already the initial condition, so this must have the initial condition zero. Right? Well, this produces one initial condition. So C, C has to be minus one. Do you agree with me? The initial condition is, is, has already been used, and also the initial condition does not depend on epsilon. If I would have had here, for instance, uh, zero plus epsilon, then I could have applied the a part of this initial condition to phi 1. But in this is not the case. The initial condition does not depend on epsilon. So this is this is correct. In fact I can write down what in general is the uh, uh, the the, uh, the equation uh, because they will all be the same again and they will be d phi n dx is minus phi n minus 1 of x. So we have a recurrent system which we can completely solve. Now one of the nice things is that we can also, in this special case, we can have the exact solution which we ignored. We did not use that. You can have the exact solution. Then you find a complicated expression, which is in the book. And if you then expand this with respect to epsilon, you get exactly this 
this thing, this, this series, it shows that it is really not only a formal series, but really a um, mathematical solution, which is converted. But that is accidental. In general, you do not know that. It is just because this, this is such a simple, simple equation that you have the exact solution. So one of the, of the big problems of all our, our work here, all described in this book, that is if you make a formal, uh, as I say, formal uh, expansions, regular or not regular, we'll come to that later, what does it mean? What is the relation with the original, with the exact solution which you do not know? The solution is defined implicitly by an equation, and you cannot solve the equation in general. So that's one of the main questions of asymptotic theory, to, to know what is the asymptotic significance of your formal expansion. Right. We'll come back to these things. But I have another problem here. What is this? Um, well, if I give <coughs> such an expansion, I do not know a priori, I do not know to start with, what is the size of these functions? Are they bounded or, or not? Suppose Suppose you would, you would get a series with something like uh, phi, well, no, another phi, of course. So, so let's take phi with bar. Um, you, you start again with sinus x, and then you get, for instance, epsilon times e to the power sinus x plus etc. Suppose you get a series which has terms like this. Or, or, just for instance, at this because you, again, this, you cannot avoid such problems. These problems arise always immediately in applications. So, how are we going to avoid this? We have to introduce another concept to, to, uh, to describe this. And I will do this now, immediately. And so you can see the problem which I described. Suppose I want to characterize these terms, the results. How will I do this? Now suppose I have a uh, function, let's call it yeah, delta of epsilon and x. And what, what is that? That is, for instance, this term, or this term. I do not specify how it depends on, on epsilon and how it depends on x, but suppose I make a formal expansion and I find all kinds of terms of this form, right? Now, I said, suppose that this, in some way this term, this becomes unbounded. How, how, how could, could I give an older estimate? There's only one way to do that, and that is to introduce a norm. Suppose the whole problem is considered on a domain D, and in this case, it's this domain, but in general, it will be another domain. You suppose I have, I have this given always when you start to study a differential equation, it's ordinary or partial, that's better to find that it will be defined on the domain. Well, there are infinite number of norms. But the most strong norm, which we will 
try to use, that is the subnorm. So you, name, you take the absolute value of delta epsilon x, and then the supreme on b. Well, the subnorm, that means the maximum value of uh, delta as a function of x, because you specify d, uh, x, let's, let's make it clear by putting here x and d. So what I get here is a function of epsilon. But I think the uh, absolute value should be inside. Sorry. Uh, the absolute value should be after the supremum. So you first take the absolute value and then take uh, the supremum. Yeah, yeah, so I... Uh, yes. Uh, because otherwise you will miss all the... Yeah, yeah, okay. Better, better, yes. It's, uh, so, one yeah. yeah, yeah, thank you. You're right. Uh, so, you take this, the supremum of x on d on the absolute value of, of this expression that you found, and that depends then only on epsilon, and we call this then delta bar of epsilon. And this is really this gives you the size of the order size of delta epsilon of x. So if you have, for instance, uh, x in 0, 1, and you have, uh, uh, say, uh, I'll take several examples. Epsilon x, if that's, that's the point, then, then that, that gives all the epsilon. Uh, if I have uh, uh, e to the power epsilon x, then it's also over epsilon. Because this runs from over e to the power epsilon to uh, e to the power, right, no, no, sorry. Yeah, that's, that's wrong, that's wrong. Uh, if x is zero, it's one. And it is one. Yeah, this is wrong. So, you should correct me. Uh, I, um, of course, I make mistakes when I adjust the calculations. But it's very easy to make a mistake. If you take a look at this, this function, this, if, or if you look at this uh, domain, then it's uh, all one. But if you take x in 1, 2, Then, yeah, it's still, it's still all one. It's still all one, yes. If you take, yeah, you have to change it a little bit to get out of, out of the results. But if you put here, for instance, you take epsilon times e to the epsilon x, then the, the error, then the estimate is all the epsilon, right? Uh, so you take many, can make many examples. And in the exercises, there are a number of simple examples. Now, there is something, there is one exercise on what, you, what happens if you use different laws. And it may be true that in, a, in an application, you don't have to use this subnorm, but you have to use another law. And that may give another estimate. So if you, if you know, I don't know if you know these expressions, L2, for instance, uh, which is the appropriate uh, uh, norm for Fourier series, uh, that gives you a different result in general than this. And then uh, again, other norms like the solar norm, energy norm, and they give you different estimates. So, uh, the expansion gives different results depending on the field classification. But the most, the most rigorous norms is the subnorm, 
And uh, that's a very good norm if you can use that, then you are usually in business. Uh, I, I will have to go on to one of the next, next problems. So, first, uh, this is, these are the basic concepts. Uh, an asymptotic sequence will, in general, be, well, I have erased it, but an asymptotic sequence, uh, that will be something of the form. The, se uh, the sequence is elements delta and epsilon, and an asymptotic series will be something like this. But there may be other order functions, of course, but as long as they then are ordered smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, and the question now is uh, what can we do with it in, in differential equations, in equations, in uh, the equations which we are interested in. So, are there any questions about this? Is this is clear? I hope so. Uh, but I think not. I think you have to, to really think about it. Okay. You cannot just simply say, ah, of course this is all trivial, because it looks simple maybe on the, on the blackboard, but when you try to apply it, you suddenly you, you will find that you are in some trouble. And that's good, as I said before, confusing is the start of enlightenment. <laughs> um, okay, yes, no questions at this moment? No. That will come later. So, there, there are a lot of interesting other things in chapter 2. For instance, there is an uh, application to a, a real life plasma problem. Uh, it's it's uh, interesting and it is kind of abstract problem and it gives a surprising result. But it takes me another hour to discuss, so then I cannot discuss chapter 4. Uh, so I hope you will. You will read about it. It's, it's quite interesting. Um, what I will do is um, I will look at a slightly different equation. Um, equation. Let's write it down here. Um, well, it's really related to what I have there. No, it's not, it's not quite the same, so I'll just do this. I will be quite happy if I solve the first two terms. 
someone wants to be more precise, you can always make it an experiment. At some point, I will stop. So, what is the what? what I, if I put this in, I get epsilon. Let's use the ex accent. And I have to write less plus epsilon squared by one. Uh, oh, twice. Actually. Yes. Okay. Twice uh, plus higher order plus and then uh, phi naught accent plus epsilon phi one accent etc. is zero. It's my formal expansion put in the equation. Um, oh. I have to all divide by powers of epsilon, right? So what does it produce? Well this is this is the the, the order one term. So find not well that's easy. It's just just zero. And what's the next one? Uh, that's all the epsilon. Well, oh, that is this term. And, uh, all the epsilon plus is this term. So you get um, phi, phi not double plus phi one accent is zero. Yes, it's okay. Ah, I've made no mistake. Just by accident. <laughs> so. Well, these are not difficult equations. You can just solve this. This is this gives you phi not x is constant. A very boring, boring result. <laughs> now, now I now I'm in trouble because I want to apply uh, the, the boundary conditions. And what should I do? I have I have two possibilities. I can say it, it, it's just one, or I can say uh, mm, it's zero. But yeah, that, that's, that's a bad choice. I mean, one is one is then correct on one side, but wrong on the other side. So what should I do? It's a problem. Anyway. Let's, let's just leave it uh, for the moment and um, solve the second one. Uh, well, uh, this is a constant, uh, so the derivative is zero. No, sorry. This is the, this, if if we know it's a constant, the derivative is zero. So phi one is also a constant. Damn. Damn. <laughs> That's the meaning. This is, uh, so if I call this T1, then phi one is is C2. So, what is the use of this formal expansion? It, it looks like a right, right, useless because it, it, you will have constants at each stage. It will go on and on. And the solution is a continuous differentiable function. Twice, in fact, continuous differentiable. So, this is really completely, we have learned something in the first part. And the first time we, we tried to apply it, we completely lost it. Well, 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 what should we do? Um, hmm. I can give you the exact solution, of course, and then you will explain what you will see what was going on. Um, maybe I should do that. Maybe, maybe that will help us as an inspiration to do other problems. Uh, I think that that's a good idea. So let, let's give the section. Then we can see what's going on. x 
I said that this is an extremely simple equation. It's called the coefficient, so the solution is very simple. It is e to the power minus x divided by one. So 
behavior is simply this. It jumps out and then goes exponentially near to the axis. So, and that destroys the formal expansion which I put it. It's, it's completely different behavior from what we have seen before. Very interesting, very instructive. So, the, what is the inspiration? Because I'm now going to do uh, a more general uh, treatment, uh, slightly more, not so very general, but a little bit general. Uh, what is the inspiration to do this? The inspiration is this. If you cannot satisfy with the formal expansion the boundary conditions or the initial condition, whatever, try to look what happens locally. In this case, everything is taking part in a small neighborhood of the origin, in this problem. Uh, or the epsilon, maybe a little bit larger, epsilon power and a half, but anyway, we, we have to look at that better later on. But in a, in a very small, going to zero with epsilon neighborhood, things are changing very rapidly. It jumps down in a very small neighborhood to nearly zero, and then it remains nearly zero. So that's the new strange behavior. Let's, um, let's try it. So that's the inspiration. If you cannot fit the conditions, look at what happens locally. But that's not trivial. How do you do that? Well, let's give uh, a setup. So, this, I can erase this, it's clear. past the wing and 
there is a lift of the airplane because of the, of the flow, it is compressed locally, and far away from the wing, the air doesn't feel much of that, of the wing, but there is a small layer in, above and under the wing, which he called the boundary layer, and Krenzschicht in German, the boundary layer, where the behavior of the fluid of the, of the airflow is different from far away. So this is a little bit like our example. Near, near this, this wing, it, this is very fast transition. It's fixed on the wing and then it, it, it changes very fast when you go outside. But of course, far away, you don't feel anything of that. But if you are 500 meters away from the, from the wing, you don't the air doesn't feel it, but there's, a, there's a, a, a boundary there where everything. So he developed that in uh, around 1920. Maybe. I don't remember exactly, but it was around 1920. And he gave a lecture on a, at a conference, it was just a short lecture, and uh, most people did not notice it. It was really fantastic new result, but uh, people realized a little bit later than it was. And that was the beginning of, of this kind of theory. Um, so it came out of uh, Errol Rocks, very bad. Now, I, I want to look with you uh, again at, at chapter 4, and then I have wrote down this equation. And that's why we, it's still not most general that will be coming the next chapters, but this will demonstrate more systematically what is going on. This is f x. f of x is just a continuous function or s differential relation which doesn't matter. And you consider x is zero one and uh, uh, oh I, I took it doesn't matter what you take as boundary conditions but I took just zero because of the uh, the function f x and it's uh, Boundary, well, you will see the boundary conditions are, are changing, well, depending on what the values of fx are. Anyway, let's uh, do the same procedure. And the procedure is, uh, let's put it here, phi is sigma uh, epsilon n phi n x from 0 to some, some value, so I get epsilon times phi naught double plus epsilon phi one double minus phi naught minus epsilon phi one and uh, some dots is f of x. So the same procedure as we did before. And then you see that the first one is very simple. The first one is by not of x is f of x. Now I'm already in trouble, in more serious trouble than before. Because it's a nice function, f of x, it, it's, it's a person. Well, I have to acquire a little bit more. If this is the solution, it should be at least twice differential. Okay, so that's the sure. But whatever, it, whatever the differentiability, it will never, only by accident, it will satisfy the initial conditions. You should have so, the minus sign there. Sorry? You should have the minus sign in front of that. Sorry, I, I don't get it. You should have the minus sign. Because why not is my Ah, yes, 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 thank you, thank you. So, so they just 
informal expansion here of all these functions, which are very easy to, to obtain, I just uh, integrate this, uh, etc. So it's only the first derivative I get from phi 1. All these things produce a, something here, but I have to get some, some jump to that solution uh, from, uh, from this value to this, to this value. This, uh, well, suppose uh, I have something like this. Depends on my fx, of course. It can be different, but suppose this is the formal uh, expansion which I have. This. And what I, so what I, I'm saying is this will be correct in the interior of the interval, but I will have a jump to zero here, and I will have a jump to zero here. It's a wild idea, but it turns out to be correct. Okay, so how are we going to handle this? How can we have, suddenly, we need a new technique. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do, uh, I want to, to see what's going here and I want to put a microscope on it. I want to, to enlarge this by a microscope. And what is the method of a microscope? That is what? Near zero, I introduce a variable psi, which is x. Well, formally minus zero, divided by some order function with the small o of epsilon. Then I have blown, if x is small, if x is near epsilon, I don't know how small, but I, 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 of the order of this order function, of that size, I don't know what it is, but something is, then the psi in psi it will be blown up. I'm enlarging it by in the neighborhood of x divided by something small and I enlarge it. Yes, it's a completely new idea. So let's introduce the psi in the equation. By the way, specify delta, only delta, delta epsilon is small or one, this epsilon goes to zero, so it goes to zero with epsilon. That's the only thing which I specify, otherwise it will not be blowing up. What will be the equation when I introduce this? Well, it's, it's simple, x is delta times psi, so I get epsilon divided by delta squared, the second Define the xi squared. In fact, I should not call this phi. As if you are a, a decent, well-known mathematician, uh, well, we just don't say it outside the, the, the lecture room. Uh, but you should not. So maybe we should say uh, this also. It, it's just a different function. But okay, we try to do it correctly. So minus phi bar is f oh f of x is uh, delta psi so what is the effect of delta as delta if delta is uh, over epsilon squared, if delta is over epsilon, let's just try different choices. And delta, for example, for it. Delta is epsilon. Then I get I double uh, no, yeah. absolute 
then there will be epsilon 1 over epsilon here. So I get minus epsilon 5 is epsilon f0 in first order plus, plus higher order. Because I have, I have 1 over epsilon here, I multiply with epsilon, I get epsilon times phi and epsilon f naught plus my rule. So that means this is not really what we, what we like. Because, so if I take, um, if I take delta of the same size as epsilon, it's, uh, this becomes really a linear function. And I cannot do really corrections enough this kind of thing. So let's, uh, let's do something else. Let's take uh, epsilon to the power of one third uh, delta epsilon to one third. Um, then this becomes epsilon to the power two third, and I still have epsilon to the power one third in before. So I have still this, this singular perturbation problem. Because I, I get an F, F naught here, but um, I, I still have here a singular perturbation problem, which I which is not what I want. So it, it's a little bit intuitive. What I, what I propose. What I propose is the following, that I take for delta the square root of epsilon. Why is that? Because if I do that, I keep as, as many terms as possible. If I take this, then I lose again the higher derivative. If I take uh, epsilon, I lose all these terms. Only if I take this, I keep as many terms as possible. So here is a kind of intuitive step. It has to be justified later on, but this intuitive step which I take. Only when I take this order function, yeah, I can put the constant in front of that as another, but only when I take this one and I keep as many terms as possible, with as much information as possible. So, um, if I do that, uh, I call this a significant, significant choice. And also a significant degeneration, degeneration of the operator. Well, what is the operator? Operator is just operator on five here. So we Locally, x is zero. This choice gives you a significant degeneration of the operator, so that's a kind of fancy way of saying that is it. for this choice that locally near x is zero, you have to keep as much information as possible. Because then the equation becomes without this second take psi squared minus phi is f naught uh, plus maybe high order uh, high order terms in the expansion of f so I'm nearly near the end um, I can solve this, and I get, as you can see from, from your knowledge of uh, differential equation, that I get exponential functions from this. Uh, the, the, the solutions are uh, exponential functions. Uh, 
And you have to see to look at the book to, to see the expression. But it's just e to the power minus six psi plus e to the power plus psi. So you get, and also some constants. So you get, uh, for phi bar, you get some constants times e to the power plus psi uh, plus c2 e to the power minus psi plus some constant, plus some constant coming out of the uh, right hand side. I'll just leave out the details. And the conclusion is then, it's an interesting conclusion, which I will keep as the last thing. Um, this one, because it's a plus, will explode. If, if you go outside of the boundary layer, then this will increase, and it can never be matched in this picture with this solution. What you really want is uh, a jump to this, to this. A jump to this solution. And, uh, and here you want to have a jump from this side. Well, if I keep plus of psi, and if I go outside the boundary there, then it will just increase. So I don't want that. So I take, that is called a matching condition. I take C1 and C0. And I choose C2 such that uh, I start, I start here with 0. That's possible. So you have to subtract uh, subtract this certain value that comes in here. Uh, anyway, this is just a small technical detail. I can choose C2 such that the final composition of the solution is exactly starting here. And I can repeat the same thing here. And then I have to introduce, uh, that is a really the last thing, I have to reduce uh, something like this. Again, that, that will be a blowing up uh, at the right hand side. And you have to introduce this. And again, the delta will be the square root of epsilon, it turns out, for a significant degeneration. Well, I think I've got a, for you a lot of new ideas. You have to think about it. There are some exercises, I'll write them down. Uh, and uh, tomorrow we will uh, do this a little bit more general because this is still an example. But we will do it a little bit more general for uh, for two-point boundary value problems like, like this. The exercise is one, two, six.